his holy name because oh he has done great things has he done any great things for anybody in here he has done great things and I'm mighty grateful that he has done great things Oh, oh, holy, bless his holy name. Oh, he has done, he, oh, he has done great things. Oh, he has done. Great things, oh, he has done great things, so you ought to bless his holy, bless his holy, bless his holy name. There's another song that says, God is able to do just what he said he would do. He's going to fulfill every promise to you. So don't give up on God, cause he won't give up on you. He's able. Come on, clap your hands with me. Oh, 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 oh. he's able. Oh, 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 oh. oh God is able to do just what he says he would do. And he will fulfill every promise that he made to me and you. Don't give up on God, cause he won't give up on you. He is able. Oh, oh, oh. I know that my God is able. Oh, Sing, he's able. 
He's able. Whatever you need, my God can supply. He's able to do exceeding and abundantly above all you could ask or think. I know He will perform. He will perform just like He said He would. He's a God that will never leave you high and dry. He will, oh, 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 don't give up on God, cause he won't give up on you. Come on, you ought to make that your declaration today. Don't give up on God, cause he won't give up on you. One last time. Don't give up on God, cause he won't give up on you. Because he is able. Hallelujah, Come on, if you're excited to be in God's house, come on, give God another great big hand. Come on, if you know we serve an able God, come on, give God another great big hand. Anybody glad to be in God's house this morning? Amen. Can we honor God for our pastor, our leader, our chieftain, the one and only Dr. Frank Ray Sr. To all of the preachers in the house. Can we thank God for our music ministry on this morning? Bishop, Bishop Pope over there on organ. Uh, my daddy, Reverend Frank Ray Jr. over there on keys. Brother Jeff Shaw on drums. And our worship leader for our 1130 AM bridge service that I do every Sunday. Brother Julian Cross, wave your hand, Julian. Hey man, thank God for him. Just 21 years old and singing like that. Amen. We thank God for his ministry. It's preaching time already in this place. And for our devotional message this morning, we have the Reverend Terry Banks in this place, and he's going to come and preach to us. He is the newly elected pastor of the Pilgrim Rest Church over there on Willie Mitchell Street over in South Memphis around the corner. And we're looking forward to how God is going to use him in this place on today. Would you extend your hand towards him and say, Reverend Branks, preach, preach. Amen. Let's receive him as he comes. Well, this is the day that the Lord has made, and we should rejoice and be glad in it. Would you do me a favor and give God praise all over this house? Come on, let's give God praise, everybody. For it is indeed a blessing. We know that millions did not make it, but since you made it, the Bible says, let everything that have breath praise the Lord. If you got up this morning, you ought to come to praise Lord, to Dr. Frank Ray, uh, we thank you for this opportunity and to our preacher, our speaker for the morning, uh, Pastor the Reverend Dr. Tolan J. Morgan, and then to all of you God's children, let me just say how good it is uh, for us to be in God's house just one more time. As we journey to the word of the Lord today, I would that you would rest on your feet as we read the word of the Lord. Uh, let me take the time to salute those uh, who are a part of the ministry at Pilgrim Rest that did show up this morning. Uh, those of you from the rest, let me see you just wave your hand. Thank God for you. Would you help me thank God for them uh, for getting up this morning uh, to support their pastor? Let's pray. Lord, help. Amen. First Peter chapter one, verses 18 and 19. 
I started a series this week at our church entitled Summer Vibes. I gave an interesting spin or tried or attempted to on the song that we as millennials like to listen to. And I thought it was befitting that as a millennial that I try to bring you into my world to understand the context for today's thought. First Peter chapter one, verses 18 and 19. For as much as ye know that ye were not redeemed with corruptible things as silver and gold from your vain conversation received by tradition from your fathers. Conversation received by your vain tradition from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ as a lamb without blemish, without spot. You may be seated. I want to share just for a few minutes this morning from this thought, get it back in blood. Get it back in blood. In 2021, Luntrell Williams and Dirk Derrick Banks, formerly a better known as Pooh Shiesty and Lil Dirk, released a song entitled Back in Blood. And while not, I cannot go into explaining to you the underlining lyrics that are found there within this song. There is meaning today, brothers and sisters, for us to understand what these brothers were rapping about. They were honestly, Dr. Way, rapping about violent activity. They were talking about the ability to be able to steal someone else's possessions as their own, to take those possessions as their own. And while they have the ability to have those possessions as their own, they also went furthermore to explain to you and I that there is a way for those whose possessions they have taken to receive or to obtain those possessions back. They wrapped their song and in that song they they said basically these words uh, if you want your possessions back there's only one way to get your possession back and the only way uh, to get your possession back uh, is that you got to come back and get it in blood such is the case in first peter well i got to be honest with you today this is not some unforeseen reality in fact, even the children of God know something about violent histories uh, that cause us to experience uh, bloodshed. In fact, you and I were born in sin. We were shaping into iniquity. And because uh, we were born in sin, shaping into iniquity, uh, then it took time and allowed us the reality uh, to experience creation uh, being separated from the creator. But if the creator... Uh, wanted to get his creation back uh, there was only one way uh, for the creator uh, to obtain possession uh, over the creation again uh, and that was simply through uh, shed blood in fact you've heard it in hebrews uh, says that without the shedding of blood uh, there is no remission uh, of sins if there is only one way uh, that these fellas obtain uh, to get possession back and it is the same way uh, that god sent jesus uh, to get you and i back uh, it is through nothing but the blood that is shed and in 1 Peter chapter 1, unless I use any more of my time in this introduction, you find and hear about 1 Peter, you hear about Peter writing to these Christians. They are Christians who are being persecuted by non-believers. These non-believers are facing uh, persecution and Peter writes uh, to them because he understands that they're facing rough and uh, tough times, which is a good moment uh, for me to parenthetically pause and say this quick in this message, uh, that as a Christian, uh, you and I both know uh, that being saved uh, does not disqualify you uh, from having to go through some life experiences, uh, but being saved uh, qualifies you uh, to have 
to deal with some stuff uh, that you didn't even know was coming. Okay, you didn't like it that way. Uh, Pastor Jeffrey Johnson says it this way. Uh, he says, God uh, only has one son uh, that knew no sin, uh, but he does not have children uh, that don't know suffering. Brothers and sisters, uh, might I submit and suggest to you uh, that if you are a child of God, uh, if you claim to be a child of God, uh, you got some stuff uh, you got to go through. You ain't feeling it. Let me try it again. Uh, John 16, 33 says, uh, in this life, uh, you will have trials and tribulations. Uh, oh, but be of good cheer, uh, for I have come uh, to over, over the world uh, already. Gold can't be tried unless gold has been placed uh, in the fire. I just want to tell you uh, that even Christians have to face complications. And he says, while these Christians are facing complications, I'm almost done. He says in this letter, there's something I want to tell you. He says, Dr. Davis, uh, while you're facing complications, here's what I want to tell you. Be faithful in your struggles. Because you know church folk, black church folk, uh, when we get hurt, we run from church. Uh, we run from God. Uh, we run from the world. Uh, but he says uh, that if you're going to be Christian, uh, when you face struggle, uh, be faithful in your struggle. He says, endure hardness as a good soldier. But he doesn't end there because you got to end at verse 5. He says, uh, the reason you endure hardness uh, as a good soldier, he says, because it pleases him uh, who called you uh, to be a soldier. He says, be faithful. But he didn't just say be faithful. He moves on. And I said, Peter, why are you telling him be faithful? He says, tell him be faithful uh, because every experience uh, that is a fatality uh, is only a fatality uh, because it's designed to develop your faith. He says, be faithful through struggles uh, because what you're going through uh, will only help design uh, and make strong your faith. Uh, and there are some of you looking at, at me right now. Uh, you can testify uh, that the only reason you got faith like you got now uh, is because of what you've already been through. The only reason you believe you can speak to mass to mountains now it's because you spoke to sickness before the only reason you can speak over your family now is because you spoke to problems before he says you got to be faithful and have faith but hold on peter why are you telling us be faithful why are you telling us to have faith peter says i love it he says the reason you're going to be faithful the reason you're going to have faith he says brothers and sisters because this is how the redeemed respond he says, if you ever want to know how to respond when you've been redeemed, he says, respond by being faithful to God and respond by allowing what you're going through to build your faith because that's how those of us who have been saved, who have been bought, ought to respond. Peter, here's the question. I'm done. Peter, who are the redeemed? Verse 20 ends or opens and says it like this. I was at the church the other day trying to figure this out, and I walked in the restroom. There was a mirror in my restroom. I looked, and I said, who are the redeemed? That mirror started talking to me. He says, if you're looking for the redeemed, Dr. Ray, he says, you are the redeemed. I didn't make that up. Actually, it's in verse 20. If you read it, he says, for God had already foreordained you to be the redeemed. It literally means that before God formed you in your mother's womb, before God allowed them to name you, before God allowed them to come together, God had already planned to bought buy you back. Uh, that's why we sing the song uh, that says, I am redeemed. Uh, bought with the blood price. Uh, Jesus has changed uh, my whole... I'm looking for five of y'all uh, that'll take the brakes off your boy this morning uh, and testify, I am uh, redeemed. But he says, hold on. The redeemed are not just those of us uh, that says you, uh, but if you are the redeemed, uh, he says the redeemed ought to contain certain characteristics. Hold on, Peter. What do you mean? Peter goes on and says, it's the foreordained. It is you. He says, but it is you, watch this, uh, that believe God got him up uh, from the grave. 
You missed it. Let me try it again. He says the redeemer are those of us who are gathered in this room uh, who believe God uh, raised Jesus uh, from the dead. Okay, here's why I want to say this. Uh, because oftentimes uh, we get so happy about shouting he got up uh, till we got the record is uh, that Jesus didn't just get up, uh, but God raised him up. He says, it's the one who says he has raised him up. But hold on. It ends by saying he's the one who has hope and faith in God. It literally says that the redeemed of those, those of us who believe God got up, but got the same hope and faith in God, that if God got a dead Jesus up, that no matter what you and I are experiencing, God can raise us up. My hope is built. Oh, nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the freedest frame, but holy lean on Jesus' name. Let me close. I've used my time. He says that it's not just about who are the redeemed. Here's the last question. Peter, how do I become the redeemed? Peter says, before I tell you how to become the redeemed, let me tell you how not to become the redeemed. He says, you don't become the redeemed by silver and by gold. He says, those are corruptible things. In other words, those things won't last. Those things won't work. Those things will mess stuff up. Those things are not good enough to pay for your eternal stay in glory. So then what works? Peter says, the only thing that's going to work is if you shed some blood. I got to quit. Thank you for your time. What do you mean shed some blood? Peter, Peter says there has to be blood shed if you're going to make it. Let me close. Peter, what is it about blood? He says blood is precious. He says blood is rich. He says, but the problem is Baptist folk don't like to talk about the blood that much. He says, the problem is that when we see blood, we equate blood in the naked eye to death. But when you understand blood, scripturally, blood doesn't identify as death. Blood identifies as life. You ain't feeling it. I was studying vaginal bleeding. I was trying to understand how women have babies. And here's what I've discovered. When a baby comes out, Trey, a baby comes out. And when it comes out, there's blood along the lines of the baby coming out. But when the baby comes out with blood, here's what it does not tell you. Uh, it does not mean that the baby is dead. Uh, because sooner or later, when you start looking again, uh, the same baby that came out with blood uh, will start crying even with blood all on it. Uh, which means then that when the baby comes out, uh, that blood is a symbolization uh, that it got the nutrients it needed. Uh, it got what it needed in its veins. Uh, so the baby can come alive. Uh, now I need about 10 of y'all uh, who can testify in this church uh, that the blood uh, has made me come alive. Uh, it's the blood. Uh, is there anybody in this church at 7 30 in the morning who can thank God uh, that his blood has made me come alive? I, I'm, I'm closing for real. I'm closing for real. Uh, here it is. Here it is. Uh, in, in Ubadal, Texas, I think I said it right, on, on May 24th, on May 24th, four days before my birthday, it made uh, it made the news that there was a mass shooting that took place in Uvidal, Texas. It, it came across the news that there were uh, four, uh, there were 19 children dead, and then there were two adults uh, dead. Trey, I went back and I read the story. Here's uh, what I discovered. They had the count wrong. That it shouldn't have been 21 people dead. It should have been 22 people dead. But the problem is, Dr. Ray, we were missing one person. They kept on interviewing everybody. And while they were interviewing everybody, they started looking around and they said, well, where is the little girl? Well, 11-year-old Maya Sorelli.
pops up out of nowhere. She is covered. And they ask Maya Sorelli, says, what happened to you, Maya? What happened to you, Maya? Maya said, I was so scared for my life that I saw my friend laying there. I took my hand and I wiped my hand in my friend's blood. And I put my friend's blood all over my clothes. I said, what do you mean, Maya? She says, here's what it means. She says, when they throw blood on me meant day, I showed up to tell them blood on my life means I'm still alive. Now let me see if I got 10 folks in this church who can testify that I'm covered in the blood we sing a song that says what can wash away my sins what can make me whole again nothing nothing but the blood of Jesus how do you know because it reaches to the highest mountain come on now help me it flows to the lowest valley the blood that gives me strength from day to day how do you know because one friday on a hill called Calvary, went in his hands, went in his feet, but I Sunday morning, didn't he get up with power? Say it, yeah, yeah, yeah. Don't do that, Dad. Gonna play it just a little bit. Thank you. 
Come on, tell somebody it's something about the blood. Come on, tell somebody it's something about the blood. Amen. Come on, give Reverend Banks another great big hand. Come on, thank God for that word. Get it back in blood. How about Reverend Frank Ray Jr.? Come on, give it up for him as well. Well, we're ready now for our second preacher for this hour. And my God, did he not preach in this place yesterday. He preached yesterday like it was the last day. So I can't wait to see where we go today. We all know him in this place already. and We're looking forward to how God is going to use him yet again on this Wednesday doing this conference just elevate your hand towards him and say reverend morgan preach preach come on let's receive him as he comes to god be the glory for the many things that he has done what he is doing and what he will do we are blessed of the lord uh, to be here today and because his mercies do not fail us morning by morning new mercies we see how good it is for us to gather together again to worship our risen christ for he is not dead he is alive and we bless him we thank him for his sweet holy spirit that lives within us to rule and regulate us for his glory can you right where you are. Just give God a quick praise right where you are. <clears throat> I am uh, thankful again and appreciative to our visionary, uh, Reverend Dr. Frank Edward Way Sr. And we thank God for him and for how he continues to uh, impact the body of Christ both locally and nationally. We have all been made the better because of what God does through this man of God. Amen. So I want to publicly appreciate and thank him uh, for this opportunity. He has plenty of other options. And so I don't take it lightly that I'm supposed to be here. We give God honor uh, for um, his love and for his choice and uh, we thank God that he's already blessed us in this place amen uh, just in the uh, Sunday night event and all that was yesterday God has blessed us in a great great way already will you help me appreciate our devotional preacher pastor elect Tariq Banks <clears throat> We are thankful for him and how God continues to order his steps and stops and how he will make his impact uh, in the Lord's church here in Memphis. We honor all of the pastors and preachers who are present today and all of you, the men and women of God that love the Lord and are called according to his purpose. If it is your custom that you stand for the word of God, I ask that you would do so. I want to summon your senses and invite your intellect to the book of Acts. Chapter number three. And it is there that the Holy Spirit has highlighted for us this context of scripture beginning with verse number one. Acts chapter three, verse number one. And I pray that your familiarity with the passage does not block you from receiving the word of the Lord today. Acts chapter 3, verse number 1. Your Bible should read, Now Peter and John went up together into the temple at the hour of prayer, being the ninth hour. And a certain man, lame from his mother's womb, was carried whom they laid daily at the gate of the temple, which is called beautiful, to ask alms of them that entered into the temple, who seeing Peter and John about to go into the temple, asked in alms. And Peter, fastening his eyes upon him with John, said, Look on us. 
and he gave heed unto them, expecting to receive something of them. Then Peter said, silver and gold have I none, but such as I have, give I thee. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. And he took him by the right hand and lifted him up. And immediately his feet and ankle bones received strength. And he leaping up stood and walked and entered with them into the temple, walking and leaping and praising God. And all the people saw him walking and praising God, and they knew that it was he which sat for alms at the beautiful gate of the temple. And they were filled with wonder and amazement at that which had happened unto him. I want to tag this text. There's movement at the gate. You may be seated in the Lord's church. <clears throat> There's movement at the gate. January of 2017, BET showed its first mini script, mini series. It was called the New Edition Story. It chronicled the success of five boys who started a music singing group and how these boys transitioned from boyhood to adult success. They were called New Edition. They went on to become one of the most successful music groups in American music history. And in order for BET to chronicle their journey, they recruited 11 males, five boys and six men to play and portray new edition from their boyhood inception to their adult success. I personally was taken uh, by great surprise at how proficient these 11 individuals portrayed the new edition group. And I kept watching the series until it finally ended. And they began to disclose that part of their success of portraying new edition was that these individuals actually spent time with the real individuals. Part of their preparation for portraying new edition required for them to spend time with the real individuals and their effectiveness in portraying them began to be disclosed. So as I watched it, it was then that I realized that I wasn't looking at Michael Bivens. I was looking at somebody who had the life of Michael Bivens in him. I wasn't looking at Ralph Tresvant. I was looking at somebody who had the life of Ralph Trasvent in him. I wasn't looking at Ronnie DeVoe. I was looking at somebody who had the life of Ronnie DeVoe in him. I wasn't looking at Bobby Brown. I was looking at somebody who had the life of Bobby Brown in him. I wasn't looking at Ricky Bell. I was looking at somebody who had the life of Ricky Bell in him. That was not Johnny Gill. That was somebody who had the life of Johnny Gill in him. 
Ladies and gentlemen, you are not Jesus. But you ought to have the life of Jesus in you. So that when somebody crosses paths with you, they don't just see you. They see the life of Jesus in you. Second Corinthians chapter four, verse 11 says that we are delivered unto the death of the Lord Jesus Christ always that the life of Christ may be manifested in our mortal flesh. And if we are Christians, the life of Christ ought to be manifested in us. Thus, ladies and gentlemen, is one of the theological threads of the book of Acts that Christ is gone, but the life of Christ has been expressed and extended into those who spent time with him. If you're going to imitate somebody, you at least need to spend time. With them. If you're going to emulate somebody. You at least need to find some time. To hang out. With them. Such as the discipline discovered in the discourse. Of Acts chapter number three. You already know by way of history. That the book of Acts records the first 30 years of church history. And it is the acts of the Holy Spirit through the apostles. But I want to tag on that, ladies and gentlemen, that the book of Acts is an extension and an addendum to the extended life of Christ empowered by the Holy Spirit through the apostles. That's significant to understand because we cannot miss the fact that though Jesus is gone, he's still there. His name is still being used. His power is still evident. And thus, ladies and gentlemen, the book of Acts now gives us some encouragement about how Christ uses his followers as agents of his power. That's important for us to understand as we probe this first uh, miracle performed by the apostles here in Acts chapter three. It is introduced to us, ladies and gentlemen, through two different itineraries. If you got a Bible and can read it, verse number one introduces to us one itinerary by which it says that Peter and John went up to the temple at the ninth hour. Our temporal equivalent to that would be 3 p.m. Notice the itinerary where they went the temple, what they went to do, pray. What time? 3 p.m. That's Peter's itinerary. Second itinerary is in verse two. Uh, Bishop Payton, it says that there was a lame man who was at the beautiful gate begging alms daily. That's the second itinerary. Lame man, where he's at? The gate. What he's doing? Begging. When is he there? Every day. Yes, 
there are two different itineraries that are introduced into this passage. One is a man at a certain time. The second one is a man there all the time. Two different itineraries converging at the same gate. The only thing they got in common is the gate. They're on two different schedules. One at three. The other one all the time. Only thing they got in common, Mitchell, is the gate. Two different itineraries converging at one spot. The one spot, ladies and gentlemen, is called the beautiful gate. Historically, it's made of Corinthian brass. It stands about 75 feet high and is 60 feet wide. It typically takes 20 men to open this gate and to close it. History tells us that it, this gate is on the eastern side of Herod's temple. Which means, Dr. Bell, in the morning, when the sun rises, on the east end of the gate, that gate has a glare and glisten that is seen at distances on the east end of the gate. It's called beautiful, Dr. Carter, because every morning you can see it without being at it. It's on the east side of the gate. Every morning, the glare and glisten of the rising sun projects that gate at long distances. And its beauty is attached to that glare and glisten every morning. But when we look at it from its Greek etymology, that word beautiful doesn't mean something of physical and, and visual greatness. But in its Greek etymology, it means it is the word horeos from where we get this term hour. It actually translates at a certain time or at the right time. It was the gate of a certain time. It was the gate of a seasonal moment which explains the conversion of these itineraries. You missed it, I'll shout myself. One man is on a certain time. Another man is there all the time at a gate called right time. Which helps us to understand, church, that maybe, maybe Dr. Davis, when we investigate this passage, maybe I want to argue that this story is not about the lame man. Because he's there all the time. Maybe this story, Dr. Pat, is about Peter. Because he's there at a certain time. That's going to affect the life of the guy that's there all the time. I want to argue that this story really is about Peter. Because this is the first time that Peter has to face a challenge without Jesus. Maybe this really isn't about the layman, it's about Peter. Can I tell you why it's about Peter? Because Peter heard Jesus say a lot of stuff that hadn't manifested in his life yet. And this is a moment that we're getting ready to see 
God's promises start to manifest in Peter's life through which the lame man is a conduit of God's promises in Peter's life. You missed it, so let me shout myself. Uh, this is Herod's temple. This is Herod's temple, which means, y'all, that Jesus frequented this temple. And if the lame man was there all the time, Jesus did the one thing that we never want him to do. Pass him by. You and I always ask the Lord, do not pass me by. If Jesus walked past this church, Jesus saw that man laying there, but Jesus didn't heal him. And the reason why Jesus didn't heal him is because Jesus assigned him to Peter. Preaching here, Tolan Morgan. I I'm trying to tell you that Jesus is not going to do everything for you because he's assigned certain things to do in your life in ministry that are, are appointed to your hand in a certain time at a certain hour. Let me see if I can put this together. Ladies and gentlemen, in the providence of God, here's what this means. It means in the providence of God, God providentially placed a powerless man in the path of a man that had power. So that the man with power could change the life of the powerless man. I got rewind in my mind. I said God providentially placed a powerless man in the path of a man that had power. So that the man with power could change the life of the powerless man. I'll try it one more time. I said God providentially placed a powerless man in the path of a man with power. So that the man with power could change the life of the powerless man. And therefore the man with power was on a schedule at 3 o'clock. Kairos to meet the guy who's there all the time, Kronos. And the intersection of time was a moment that Peter's ministry would start to give life. And therefore, Peter Church is the man's answer. But the man is Peter's question. Can I tell you what the question is, Dr. Ray? Here's the question, church. Peter, when you come across this man, he's got one question for you. His question for you, sir, is that are you so caught up in your church of 3,000 that you ain't got time for one? Because in chapter 2, Peter stands and preaches the first post-Pentecostal sermon. And he's got the first mega church. But I want to know, are you so caught up in your mega church that you ain't got time for one? You so caught up in the folk who can give to you. We want to see, can you give to somebody that can't give to you? And that's God's question for some pastor in here. Are you so caught up in your membership that you ain't got time for one who is outside your gate? You got 3,000 members. As a matter of fact, 3,120. 120 from the upper room and another 3,000 from chapter 2. But I want to know, 
Do you got a heart for one? Or are you stuck on the arrogance and the ego of 3,000? I wish I had a church in here. And sometimes, ladies and gentlemen, God drops stuff at your gate to see if you're going to take what happened in the temple outside of it. Come on, come on. Don't, don't look at me with that attitude. Sometimes we've got to understand that what happens in the temple should manifest at the gate. I'm just trying to see. Are you so caught up on your title? Your car, your collar, and your armor bearers. That you ain't got time. For one. To whom you can get no credit, no check, or no camera. Wish I had a church here today. And maybe, ladies and gentlemen, Acts chapter 3 is designed not just to celebrate us, but to check us. Because this gate is the gap between the beauty of holiness and the brokenness of humanity. You're going in the temple and God is moving outside of it. If you're going to meet me in the temple, you ought to have an interest in how I'm moving outside of it. I don't want to be serving a God that only moves in one place. I don't want to serve a God that can only move in the house. He is everywhere at the same time. I want to see God move outside the gate as much as I see him move in the temple. This is a critical moment for this preacher. Are you so caught up in your 3,000? You ain't got time. For one. And Peter answers the question, Mitchell. He stops on his way to prayer. He on his itinerary. <laughs> it is the place where Kronos and Kairos merge. And this is a set time for a set purpose at a set place outside the gate. Stops and looks at the man and says something critical to him. Says, sir, uh, I, I want to ask you, can you give me some money? Peter, the text says, fastens his eyes on him and says, look on us. Silver and gold I don't have. Such as I have give I thee in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Rise up and walk. Church, this is a critical moment. This is where the text turns. The text pivots y'all on three words. Look on us. Lord, I can't get no help here. I said the text pivots. On three words. Look on us. I believe church that we are in a season. Where the church has to raise this question for itself. Because if our societies are going to change. They are going to have to look. On us. If our communities are going to have to be affected for God in a great way, they're going to have to look on us. And they're going to have to see you outside of your church. He didn't say come in and look on us. We got to see you outside your church because the same glory and grace that you have in the sanctuary or the transfer outside.
Look on us. There's so many social ills happening in our world. And there is a time, this is a critical time, church, where the people got to look on us. This is interesting, y'all. Because when he says look on us to this man, he's actually challenging the man to make one critical decision. Y'all ready? If you're going to change your life, you've got to first change your focus. What he was telling the man is, this is a moment that you got to not concentrate on being broken. And concentrate on something better than what you've been looking at in yourself. Uh, I, think, I think, ladies and gentlemen, every Sunday, we have the opportunity to present something to God's people that is better than themselves. But it all begins with, do they have the ability to look on us? Uh, that, that's critical because you, you and I possess by God the wherewithal to provide for them something that will change their lives but it's got to start with their ability to just start looking on us change your focus off of your own brokenness because you expected me to give you something of what you want when I'm going to give you what you need you want more money, but you don't want to be healed. You want more money that, that meets an external need, but I'm going to give you something that meets an internal need. Because if I give you something that meets an internal need, I'm going to change your posture and position so you won't have to be begging, you'll be making. look on us he says to the man now listen uh, silver and gold have I none that's questionable because Peter you just raised the offering in the last chapter I thought I had some Bible folk around here you got access to money I may not have money on me right now. That's critical, y'all. Because he says to this man that the first means of change with you is that I want to give you hope by looking on us, but I also want to meet you at a place of common ground. You missed it. You broke and so am I. And I'm trying, to, I'm trying to tell you that it, it, though I got access to money, I'm willing to come down on your level first in order to pull you out of where you are. And ladies and gentlemen, if we're going to do effective ministry, people can't see us high and lifted up. They've got to be able to connect with us on common ground. Even God understood that he was too high for us. So the Bible says, and the word became flesh. Now, if God understands that he too high for you, who are you to walk around like you better than everybody else? If you can meet people on common ground, you can change lives. Even God knew he was too high. Find the place of common ground. I got access to money, but right now I need to meet you, not where I am. Oh, have mercy here, but where you are. We got something in common, but what I want to give you is not temporary. Because if I give you money, it's still not going to solve the root problem. What I got to give you is something greater. In the name. 
Somebody should have got happy right along there. I said in the name of the Lord Jesus of Nazareth, rise up and walk. Uh, Dr. Foster, I thought he should have said in the name of Jesus Christ, rise up and walk. If you got a Bible and can read it, Frank, that's not what he said. He said, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ of Nazareth. His name should have been enough. But you had to cite where he's from. I want to suggest church that that was significant because you called him from Nazareth so that you can announce to everybody who heard you at the church that who you killed is still alive because <laughs> it was the church folk along with the religious rulers who killed Jesus of Nazareth about a month and a half ago. So when Peter says, in the name of the Lord Jesus of Nazareth, I'm talking about the guy y'all put on Calvary's hill. I'm talking about the guy you submitted to Roman capital punishment and who you thought you killed, he is still here. I called his name to prove that you failed in killing him. You thought just because the absence of his presence means the absence of his power. That's not true. He's still working in the earth. He's still working miracles. He's still healing bodies. He's still raising the dead and the one you killed is still alive it's critical because there are some announcements you got to make just to send a message to the enemy that they failed <laughs> you removed me for the same reason to try to stop my power. And Peter is clear to announce that he is back and his power is still evident in the earth. Jesus of Nazareth, rise up and walk. You really need money in this context and posture because you're not working right on the inside. This is congenital lameness. He has never walked Carter in his life. Because the text says he was born lame. I wish I had some Bible folk around here. This is congenital lameness. He came in the world broken. With the inability to walk and Peter's point is you won't walk right until you work right you will walk right on the outside when you work right on the inside so I don't need to deal with you externally if I fix you internally it's going to fix your external for greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world so let me deal with your inside that will naturally manifest change on the outside so since y'all missed it let me give it to you again <clears throat> for the first time in his life at the age of 40 we find out his age in chapter 3 and 4. He's 40 years old. The text says. That when he declared the name of Jesus. And took him by the right hand. One was authority. The other one was agency. 
the man got up. He leaped, stood, and walked. Leap indicates strength. Stood indicates balance. Walked indicates control. When God's power through God's agent hit this man's life, he gained strength, balance, and control. I can't get no help here. And since he's never done it in his life, it means he became a baby at 40. Which theologically means at 40, Dr. Youngblood, he was born again. I can't get no help here. Ladies and gentlemen, if you just give people the gospel in the authority of Jesus Christ by the power of the Holy Ghost, you will see resurrections of people who weren't able to walk, but they'll get up and be born again. So Peter sees a resurrection in the name of he who is the resurrection. I'm done. I like this part of the story. He raises him up from the gate. But the man decided to go to church. I thought y'all read the Bible. The text says when he got up, he went leaping and walking and praising God and went to prayer service with Peter and John. You missed it. Sometimes, brothers and sisters, some people are going to join your church and it won't be through your sermon. It's going to be through your service at the outside of the gate. Peter preached and 3,000 came. But on the outside of the gate, he stood in the authority of Jesus. And when you service people on the outside, they'll find their own way on the inside. Preach Tolan Morgan. And maybe as we are all perfecting our preaching, we've got to remember that there's a work to be done on the outside of the gate that will let other people come in to the gate. Translated, if you do the work in the community, they'll find your church. If you do the work on the outside of the gate, they'll come into your temple on their own. Went to church by his own choice. They didn't tell him to come to church. He chose. Go to church. Because I want to go to a church. Where God just isn't stuck in your sanctuary. That, that God that you worship in that church. Ought to be felt outside. Of the gate. Here's the close y'all. Here it is. Thank y'all for your patience. Uh, this, is, this is a matter that was so interesting to me because they went to church praising God and he went leaping and running and walking for the first time in his life. And when I took a final look at this text, Pastor Ray, I saw the text moving in one direction. Here it is. Verse 1, Peter and John went up to the temple. Verse 4, the man is laying at the gate. Peter and John are standing over him, which means he had to look up. Verse 6, 
Jesus, Peter says to the man, in the name of Jesus, rise up. Verse 7. Peter extended his hand to lift him up. Verse 8. The man went leaping up. Still slow on that side. I saw this text moving in one direction. Verse 1. They went up. Verse 4. He looked up. Verse 6. He rose up. Verse 7, they lifted him up. But verse 8, if you've been risen up, risen up, if you went up, if you had somebody to lift you up, somebody shouldn't have to tell you to praise up. You ought to praise up all by yourself. Blessed assurance. Jesus is mine. Oh, what a foretaste. A glory divine heir of salvation purchase of God born in his spirit and washed in his blood this ooh, is my story ah, yeah. and this is my song and I got myself a witness in this place I'm praying in my savior Ooh, all the day long have I got a witness here if y'all don't mind would you look at somebody I said look at somebody and tell them neighbor I got my own reasons why I walked in here this morning I'm walking and leaping and leaping and walking because since I met Jesus yeah what a wonderful change has come into my life have I got a witness here the Bible says yeah that this text only moved in one direction everything was moving up since this man met Jesus. Everything was moving up since Peter operated in Jesus' name. Y'all slept on that. I said everything was moving up. I want to ask y'all a question. Since you are working for Jesus, is your church moving up? Since you are operating in his name, is there movement at the gate? Everybody that's had an encounter with Jesus eventually is going to move up. Y'all ain't feeling me. If you look back at this text, this text, y'all, was about a man who was lame. But when he met Jesus, he got up and lame means he was dead on the inside. But when he met Jesus, he rose on the outside. Y'all slept on that. I'm trying to tell you that Peter preached resurrection and then saw resurrection because there was a man at the outside of the gate who was dead for a while but the power of God raised him up y'all must don't like the Bible one Friday there was another man on the outside of the gate that died for three days but Sunday morning the power yeah of God 
raised him up. And that's not all that we gonna experience. One day he coming back and the clouds shall fall. The trumpet shall sound and the dead in Christ shall rise up. Is it anybody here that's thankful that since you met Jesus, you are on your way up? I said, since you met him, you're on your way up. And since you up, you got to help somebody else up. I said, since you're up, you got to help somebody else up. Look at somebody and tell them neighbor. Ooh. I said, look at somebody and tell them neighbor. If you don't know how to get somebody else up, here's my suggestion. How to reach the masses, mean of every birth for an answer. Jesus gave the key, and I, if I be lifted up. Yes, sir. All men unto me. Give them Jesus when you don't feel like it. Give them Jesus when they're outside the gate. Give them Jesus. That same Jesus got enough power to lift you up. Now, I need y'all to do me a favor. I need y'all to do me a favor. I need you to touch your neighbor on the shoulder and tell them in the name of Jesus. Right. Up and walk. That neighbor didn't get happy. Touch somebody else on the shoulder and tell them in the name of Jesus. Rise up and walk. That neighbor didn't get happy. Look at somebody else and tell them neighbor in the name of Jesus, rise up and walk, cause you don't know who came in here, wasn't able to get up on their own, but if you got Jesus, they ain't looking at you, they looking at somebody that's got the life of Jesus on the inside, and if you believe it, I said, if you believe it, look back at him and tell him, neighbor, it's time to rise up and walk. Since you made it the last two years, rise up and walk. Since you didn't die, rise up and walk. Since you're still here, rise. Up and walk in the authority of the name of Jesus. Now let everything, I said, let everything, I said, let everything that's got breath open your mouth and give him glory because you still got the power. Anybody in here got the power of the Holy Ghost? By the authority of the name of Jesus, say it. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Ain't he all right? 
I said, it'll be all right. Anybody got the power? If you don't mind shouting at 8 o'clock in the morning, I will bless the Lord at all times. And his praise shall continue to be in my mouth. Let everything, I said, let everything that's got breath. Man, I got happy. Heads are bowed and eyes are closed. Gracious God, our Father, we thank you so much for this wonderful privilege. Could be somebody here now that have not accepted Christ as your Lord and Savior. Your life can be changed right now. Maybe you just came in from the street, didn't know church was going on, but you're here now and you've heard the words, you've heard the gospel. Today can be the first day of the rest of your life. Let a Christian experience candidate for baptism. Maybe you moved here from some other area. You have a place to stay. You have a job to go to. You have transportation. But you don't have a covering. You need to be somewhere where the word is taught. Where the people will love on you. Help you to grow and develop and be what God would have you to be. If you are here, this is your chance. To come now while you can. The door is open. Invitation is extended. Hallelujah. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bless you. You know, there are gifts in the Bible, 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 12, say he give gifts as he will. In other words, the Lord decide what gift he's going to give you and who he's going to give the gift to. <laughs> That's a gift of <clears throat> Government, gift of government is a gift that God gives some people, the gift to pilot a ship through a storm. That's the gift he gives to moderators and state conventions to be able to help churches grow and glow and get out of crisis and get along together. That's a gift of wisdom he gives to some people that can go in and dissect the word 
and pull it up to the surface, you can read it a thousand times and never see it because you ain't got that gift. Gift of wisdom, dig it out, bring it to the surface, and then that's a gift of knowledge. The gift of knowledge depends on the gift of wisdom because the gift of knowledge take what the gift of wisdom have brought forth and run.